الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى ما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنك لا تهدي من أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء صدق الله العظيم Honorable ulama, brothers and sisters listening at home. Alhamdulillah, at Dawatul Islam Masjid Sutil, we have a weekly seerah session where we are covering the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the purpose behind this is so that by listening to the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should start following the example laid by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through our actions and through our tongue, we should be reciting Duru Sharif salutation upon Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the whole purpose of doing seerah. Two things. Through our actions, we should be following the lifestyle of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And through the means of our tongue, we should be reciting Duru Sharif salutation upon Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam abundantly. So Alhamdulillah, every week we have the seerah session. And the we have reached the age where Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is at the age of 47. Now for those people who were not present in our last week Sira session, I will briefly go over what was mentioned so that they are aware as to what's happening in this week Sira session. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the age of 40, he's received prophethood. So from 40 to 43, he's been uh, propagating Islam secretly only to his family and very close associates at the age of 43 Quranic verses are revealed upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informing Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that fasda' bima tu'mar and wa anzir ashiratak al-aqrameen that oh Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now you need to propagate you need to openly declare this message to everyone so at the age of 43 he openly declared this message to everyone that I am a Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who needs to be worshipped and there should be no idol worshipping. And soon people started embracing the message of Islam and becoming Muslim. And when the non-Muslims, the mushrikeen of Makkah, when they saw this, the people have started embracing this new religion, the religion of Islam, they thought to themselves that we should do something about this. We should put a stop on this. So the first tactic which they used was they went to Abu Talib to compromise. Because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was under the protection of Abu Talib. So they could not do anything to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they first went to Abu Talib and they explained to Abu Talib to, uh, to explain to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to stop propagating this religion of Islam. Compromise didn't work, so they went and they threatened Abu Talib. Again, threatening Abu Talib didn't work. So then they decided, the why hide behind the bush? Let us just go directly to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Utba, he went, again he went to compromise with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That didn't work. Then after he went to threaten the mushrikeen of Makkah, they went to threaten Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That didn't work. And thereafter, they went on to the third stage. The compromise, threaten, and the third stage was torture. And the mushrikeen of Makkah, they started torturing them. Uh, not only Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the Sahabas. And as, we, and as I stated two sessions ago, that a person can only take a level of torture. Then after that, death overcomes. So when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reached the age of 45, and the Muslims were being tortured, one, uh, uh, one Sahabi by the name of Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala an, anha She was tortured And at the age of 45 She gave her life for the cause of Islam So she was the first person To give her life for this cause For the cause of Islam The first sh- shaheed is Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha. So when this happened, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to do something. So, Prophet, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that 
take a couple of sahabas and inform Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that they should migrate to another country. So Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made an announcement, and in the first journey, fifteen, and in the second journey, eighty sahabas they gave the name that we will migrate to Abyssinia. So in this way, at the age of 46, Islam, the Sahabas were protected. 80 Sahabas were protected and they moved to Abyssinia. And they started living in uh, Abyssinia, which is now called Ethiopia. So those were protected. But what about those who were in Makkah to Mukarramah? They were still being tortured. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthened them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, He protected the people of Abi, He protected the Sahabas by making them uh, uh, migrate to Abyssinia. And those people who were in Makkah al Mukarramah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthened them. And how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen those people who were in Makkah al Mukarramah? By the conversion of Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, and by the conversion of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. Because till this time, there were people becoming Muslim. But they were the slaves. The, uh, 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 the people uh, who, who, who were poor. So when Hamza, when Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala an became Muslim, this was the first time, my brothers and sisters, that someone from a high lineage, someone, someone who was a warrior had become Muslim. And by these two becoming Muslim, it strengthened the Muslims. To such an extent, my brothers and sisters, that it is stated in books that before the embracement of Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and before Umar radiallahu ta'ala and embraced Islam, so he embraced Islam when Prophet was 46. From prior to that, Sahabas did not have the courage to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of Kaaba. Because if they did, they would have been tortured. Only Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was the only person who could go in front of Kaaba and who would be able to recite the Qur'an and he would be able to perform salah. But when Umar radiallahu ta'ala and became Muslim, when he became Muslim, he told Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that from now on we will not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discreetly. We will openly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, he led a couple of sahabas. Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he led a couple of sahabas. And they went and they marched and they went towards Kaaba. And this was the first time when the sahabas read openly in front of Kaaba. And this was the time when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave the title, gave the title of Farooq to Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. The oh, Umar, your title is Farooq. Because you are the one who's differentiated between evil and haq, haq and batil. So this was a time when Umar radiallahu ta'ala who was given this title, Farooq. So, uh, this was uh, discussed last week and inshallah we will carry on. So now, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is at the age of 46 and the sahabas are protected and they are strengthened. They are protected. How? By 80 sahabas moving to Abyssinia. They are strengthened by who? By Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, and by Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. So when this incident happened, these three incidents in that year, the mushrikeen of Makkah, they couldn't believe it. All that planning went down the drain. Because from, from the age of 43 to 46, the whole purpose was to stop this mission. And what's happened? It was like a slap on the face. Meaning, their whole plan went down the drain. The Hamza and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah had become Muslim. Because at that time, and even now, we see a trend. That when someone of a, of a high profile person, he accepts, he, he does something, then there's people who will follow. And this is what they were scared of. That now Hamza radiallahu ta'ala has become Muslim. But more than that, Umar radiallahu ta'ala has become Muslim. Now people will embrace Islam more freely. So they had to do something. So as we say, they went back to the drawing board. And they thought, something has to be done. Something has to be done to stop the mission spreading of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So my brothers and sisters listening at home, they gathered together. And Abu Jahl, he was the one who called this meeting. And he said, what shall we do? This has happened. Something needs to be done. So what, what tactics have they tried? They've tried the tactic of compromise. That hasn't worked. They've tried the tactic of threatening. That hasn't worked. They've used a third tactic, which is torture. That hasn't worked. Now usually, the, usually uh, you go to the fourth tactic, and that is assassination. Because after torture, there is nothing left besides killing. But these people, they knew that they could not assassinate Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? Because Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was under the protection of Abu. Obviously, he was under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa taala. But he was also un- under the protection of Abu Talib. Because when Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was living with his grandfather Abdul Muttalib, and when Abdul Muttalib was about to pass away, he called his son Abu Talib and he said to Abu Talib, "Though Abu Talib, now you will look after." My grandson, Muhammad, your nephew, and you will protect him. This was a wasiyyat given by Abdul Muttalib to his son Abu Talib at the age of, when Prophet was at the age of eight. So Prophet sallallahu is living in Mecca al-Mukarramah under the protection of Abu Talib. And who is Abu Talib? Abdul Muttalib, he was a leader of the clan of Banu Hashim. When he passed away, the, the, the leadership was passed Onto Abu Talib. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being protected by Abu Talib. And not only that, not only was he protected by Abu, uh, by Abu Talib, he was also protected by another clan. Scholar states that once Abu Talib got scared, that I, I have this fear that something might happen to my nephew. So I want an extra protection. You know, in the, even in this world, we have extra, extra. So Abu Talib wanted extra protection for his nephew. So he went, and he went to another clan. And this time he went to the clan of Banu Muttalib. Not Banu Abdul Muttalib, Banu Muttalib. Who are Banu Muttalib? So, i just explain. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his father's name is Abdullah. His father's name is Abdul Muttalib. His father's name is Hashim. And his father's name is Abdul Munaf. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah, Abdul Muttalib, and Hashim. Hashim had another brother called Muttalib. Not Abdul Muttalib, Muttalib. So Hashim, so everyone who came under the Hashim family tree, they're called Banu Hashim. Hashim had another brother called Muttalib. Anyone who came under that clan are called Banu Muttalib. So Abu Talib, he wanted extra protection for his nephew. So he went to Banu Muttalib and said, that will you be able to give protection to my nephew as well? And they agreed. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not, un- not only under the protection of Banu uh, Hashim, but also under the protection of Banu Muttalib. This meant that if anyone, na'udhu billah, assassinated or killed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then two tribes, there would be a war between that person and that person's tribe against the tribe of Banu, Muttal- Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. And people in Mecca al mukarramah respected the, the clan of Banu Hashim. Because the clan of Banu Hashim, they were in charge of, of, of the Kaaba. So they were not rich or wealthy, but they had a very symbolic uh, status in Mecca al mukarramah And if you remember from the start, it was Abdul Muttalib who found Zamza, Zamzam. He was the founder of Zamzam. It was Abdul Muttalib that people saw that because of Abdul Muttalib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Kaaba. So they had a very symbolic status. So what I'm trying to say is when Abu Jahl and all these mushrikeen in Makkah, when they were gathered, this option was not there of assassinating Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then they went higher. There's another tactic they thought we'll use. And what is that tactic? That tactic is used even in the 21st century, my brothers and sisters listening. And what is that? Yes, some people may have answered correctly. That is my brother's boycott. Because what is the purpose of boycott? The purpose of boycott is so that the other person surrenders. 
You give so much, you inflict so much economic sanctions that the other person has to surrender. And we see in the 21st century, even in this world, people use an organization and groups of people, they use boycott. And boycott, if it's used at a, a, a very strategic level, can make things change. We don't have to go so back. Just look at the Montgomery boycott, which happened in 1955. This lady by the name of Rosa Park, she, in, in, uh, in Montgomery, you weren't allowed, black and white were not allowed to sit in the bus together. The white were at the front and the black were at the back. And this is clear discrimination. And, it, and Rosa Park, she sat and the, the bus conductor said, you're not allowed to sit here. And she refused and she was jailed. And the boycott happened in 1955 for one year. And in 1956, because of the strategic of using boycott as the, as the tactic, the civil right got their uh, 1956 uh, uh, discrimination law. That it is, uh, uh, it, is against, it is against constitution that black and white it should be separated. So what I'm trying to say is boycott, the whole purpose of boycott is so that the other persons or the other organization or the other company surrenders. So now Abu Jahl, it is stated that he is the one who came up with this idea. And the reason he came with, with this idea was because there was on, they only had two options at this time. And the two options were Either Abu Talib passes away. Because if Abu Talib passes away, that meant that the protection has gone. Because by default, that protection would go to the next person. So the, the, protection, the protection would go. Or the second option was that Abu Talib himself revokes the protection. So the idea of this boycott was that will inflict so much suffering to the, to the clan of Banu Muttalib and Banu Hashim that they revoke the protection. And once they revoke this protection, then we can do anything with Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa So Abu Jahl, he got around 40 high-ranking people from Quraysh. And he put this in front of them. And they all agreed that yes, I think we can use this tactic. And this tactic will make Abu Talib renounce. And he will not uh, protect Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa so they went to Abu Talib for the last time. And this is when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is at the age of 47. Oh, Abu Talib, we've come with the last option. And the, the last option we come is this, that you give us Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we will give you blank check, meaning we will give you whatever you ask for. You give us Muhammad to us. You hand him over to us. Or either you revoke this protection. You, you say that I don't protect Muhammad Wasallam. If you do not agree on any of these two conditions, then we have made an agreement within us that all the tribes will boycott the, the clan who have protected Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is your clan, Banu, Mut, Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. We will boycott. Now everyone knows what the reply of Abu Talib had to be. Abu Talib replied, you can do whatever you want. I am not going to hand over my nephew to you. So, the mushrikeen of Makkah Abu Jahl, to give importance to this boycott, he called, some narration says Ikrama, some narration says Baghid, and some narration says Mansur, that write this down, write this boycott down. And what was the boycott? That we are going to, uh, uh, the sanctions of economic sanctions, meaning we will not trade, we will not sell anything to Banu, Muttalib, to Banu Hashim or Banu Muttalib. Neither they can sell anything to us. So buying and selling is stopped. We cannot sell, we cannot buy, and they cannot sell, they cannot buy from us, and we cannot do with them. Number one. Number two, no intermarriages. We will not get married to any of Banu Muttalib or Banu Hashim tribe and neither they can marry us. And thirdly, they will live in Mecca as aliens, meaning we will not talk to them. Three uh, points they put down. 
And the person who wrote this, he started, Bismikallahum, and he wrote this boycott. And what Abu Jahl did, to give more sanctity, so they've written it down, to give more sanctity to this, he told one of the men, they go into Kaaba, and inside the Kaaba, hung this up. Inside the Kaaba, hung this up. There was no need for this, but to just give more sanctity. It's like, you know, when children, they get together, and they say, don't lie. Look, there's Quran in front of you. Look, there's masjid there. You shouldn't be lying anyway. But th- th- this just gives more sanctity. So they wanted to put more sanctity on this parchment, on this uh, declaration which they made. So they, Abu Jahl and others, they hung this up inside the Kaaba to give that holiness. And this happened at the age of 47. And Abu Talib and the clan of Banu uh, Hashim and the clan of Banu Muttalib, they were living in Mecca al Mukarramah and no one was talking to them. They were aliens because of this boycott. So Abu Talib had to do something about this. And the only way he thought would be that if everyone from our tribe and the tribe of Banu Muttalib gets together, we will find strength in unity. And we see this in today's world as well. That you ask someone that, uh, will you be fasting tomorrow? Winter days. And they'll say, brother, I'm finding it really hard. How can I fast until four o'clock? And they find it hard. But you meet the same brother in Ramadan and he say, are you fasting? And I say, yeah, alhamdulillah, I'm fasting. Yeah. Sorry, we're just checking whether the mixed is working. Yeah. Sorry, very phone call. That mixer might not be working. Okay. So where was I? So Abu, uh, where was I? Abu Talib. So yeah. So now Abu Talib, he thought. No, I so yes. As I was saying, so you meet the same person, and he would say, "Yeah, I'm fasting." Why? Because when everyone is doing the same thing, you find strength. You don't. You don't find that as a burden because everyone's doing the same thing. So but Abu Talib, he wanted. Banu Hashim and Banu, Mut- Banu Muttalib to be all together so they can find strength in unity. So now in, in uh, Makkah al in the outskirts, Banu Hashim and other clans, they had lands. Their own lands. Even now, uh, especially in India, uh, people own land outside the Gam, outside the villages. So in Makkah al lands were, uh, were under different tribes. So Banu Hashim had lands on the outskirts of Makkah al and this land is called Shabi Abi Talib, uh, the valley of Abu Talib. And for those who are not aware, it's near the Marwa side. If you carry on going from the Marwa side, that's where this uh, that, uh, where this Shabi Abi Talib is. So there's, uh, if you look on the map, there's mountains. Three, there's mountains. Uh, so there's mountain uh, all around, and there's only one entrance inside. So you can only go in and out from one uh, side. Because all the other side, you've got mountains there. Okay, so this was owned by uh, uh, the Banu Hashim tribe. So Abu, Shabiyah, so, uh, Abu Talib said to his uh, clan and to the clan of Banu Muttalib, that look, there's no use us staying in Makkah al mukarramah like this. Let's all stay together until the boycott finishes. So they all, not migrated, but they all moved to this Valley of Abi Talib. See, it was a self-imposed exile. Self-imposed exile. Because no one was talking to them. They couldn't eat, they couldn't buy, they couldn't sell. It was a, so they, they thought, Abu Talib thought that they'll find strength in this. So, Banu, Mut, Banu Hashim tribe and Banu uh, Muttalib tribe. Both of these tribes, they've now entered this valley. And they've camped there. And their intention is that we're going to camp in this area until the boycott finishes. And they didn't know how long this boycott is going to happen. So they took all the provision 
okay, with them. And the boycott at the age of 47 started. So all the provision which they had, which they bought, all the food and everything, they started eating from that. Slowly, slowly, because provision, it finishes. Even if you take, as whatever you take, it will eventually finish. So the food which they took into this uh, valley of Abi uh, Shabi Abi Talib, it finished. So when this, when the food finished, now they had to use their money to buy food. But the people of Makkah, because of this agreement, they would not sell anything to the people of Banu Muttalib and Banu Hashim. But what you have to remember is this agreement was with the the Quraysh, the Meccan people, and Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. This did not include those people who came outside from Makkah al Mukarramah. But what used to happen was when people would come from outside of Makkah al Mukarramah, Abu Jahl, and by the way, Abu Lahab, he's part of Banu Hashim. He's part of Banu Hashim, so he should have been inside this uh, uh, this valley, but he defected. He said, I don't want to be part of this. And Abu Lahab was not part of the boycott. And because of his enmity against Prophet ﷺ, what they did was, anyone who would come from outskirts of Makkah al-Mukarramah into Makkah for trade, for any buying and selling, they would tell him, look, although you are not, uh, 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 you're not in this boycott, but do not sell anything to these people. And if you have to, if you have to, then inflate your price so high that they are not able to buy anything from you. And this will happen. Whenever a, a caravan, whenever someone would come and they went to buy something, the price was so inflated that they wouldn't be able to buy. And whatever money they had, they spent on the inflated price. But soon, my brothers and sisters listening, even that money which they had, it diminished. It finished. This is why some people they ask that how come Khadija al Kubra radiallahu ta'ala an, anha at the age of 40, she's the richest person. She is one of the rich ladies of Makkah al-Mukarama. But when she passes away, she doesn't have any money because of spending everything prior to boycott and in boycott. She spent whatever she had for Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, for the clan of Banu Hashim and for the clan of Banu Muttalib, everything what she had, she spent. And all the other people, all the other Sahabas and non-Muslims as well, my brothers and sisters, they spent whatever they had with them. And soon a time came when they've run out of food, they've run out of money. Now they've got nothing to live on, because they never knew how long this boycott is going to stay. Now Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has reached the age. Of 48 now. Now they've reached the second year. 48. And now things are getting really bad. Sahabas and the non-Muslims as well. From that tribe. They were getting so hungry. So hungry that it comes in books. That they would go out and they would eat grass. Some narration states that if we... When we did stool. One, sahab, one person says that... If you saw our stool you would not be able to differentiate between our stool and the stool of animals. Because what we ate and what they ate was the same, meaning grass. And it is stated that in Makkah al-Mukarramah you could hear the wailing sound of those children crying from that part, from the eastern side of Makkah al-Mukarramah where this Shabi Abi Talib was, night time. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, radiallahu ta'ala, who himself narrates that I once went out for uh, 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 to urinate, and I came across a flesh. I picked it up, and then I took it back to my camp, and I saw it was a dead animal's camp, uh, a, a dead animal skin. I washed it, I cooked it, and I ate that for three days. This was a position of Muslims and non-Muslims who were from that tribe who were living there. Nothing, no food. So how did they, how did they, how, how did they strive and how did they uh, stay alive? You know, some people have this question and then how, how could they have stayed alive? My brothers, 
and sisters listening at home. It was the non-Muslims. There were non-Muslims in Makkah al Mukarramah, in Makkah al Mukarramah, who who did not become Muslim, but they they were on the side of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they knew that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a just person. We see this as well in today's world. that you are in, you are you are at work, you are somewhere, you are you are you are a man of principle, then even non-Muslims will regard you as something. So these non-Muslims, what they, what they used to do, like Hakim ibn Huzam, Mut'im ibn Adi, what they used to do? They used to load the camel with food. And then they used to go near the Shabi Abi Talib because they couldn't enter. Because if they entered, their life would have been in jeopardy. So they would go outskirt and they would untie the camel and they would hit the camel so hard that the camel would run in straight line and the camel would run in straight line and would enter the, the valley. And that's how the food smuggling used to happen. And who used to do this? The non-Muslims. Mut'im bin Adi was a non-Muslim. Hakim bin... These, some of these were non-Muslim at this time. Later on they became Muslim. But at this time they were non-Muslims. And this is what they did for Muslims at that time. And my Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he appreciated. And I, I want to mention this point. He appreciated what these non-Muslims did for the Muslim at this time. They didn't have to. Because if they got caught, their life would have been jeopardy. But because of, they knew who Prophet was. They knew the justice of Prophet They knew he was a man of principle. They wanted to help him. Not only help him, they helped the clan. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appreciated their sacrifice. Appreciated the contribution of them. My brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, we've made our masajid. We've done so many work. And many a times, a non-Muslim, because all of this, there might be a non-Muslim who have helped us, whether in a community work, whether even on a personal level, we're living and our neighbor is a non-Muslim who's helped us a lot. Then we should appreciate their contribution. We shouldn't forget them. Mut'im bin Adi, Mut'im bin Adi, he's a non-Muslim, my brothers and sisters. He's helping Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mut'im bin Adi dies as a non-Muslim. He dies as a non-Muslim. And I want everyone to listen to this very attentively. The bat- Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrates to Medina Ma- Ma- al-Munawwara and in the second year, battle of Badr takes place. Thousand men from Makkah al-Mukarramah, they march Medina al-Munawwara. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's got 313 sahabas and even them were not fully equipped. And the battle begins. And through the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Muslims, they win this battle. And they win this battle and they capture 70 people from the mushrikeen. And they are put in front of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these are the 70 captives who we've captured from those uh, from, uh, from the enemies. Their hands are tied. Their hands are tied. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is looking at them. And what words come out from the lips of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? <coughs> to show the appreciation of non-Muslims, my brothers and sisters. He says, looking at them. Allah Akbar. He says, لَوْ كَانَ مُتْعِمْ بِنْ عَدِي حَيًّا Because Mut'im bin Adi, before Battle of Badr, he had passed away. And he had passed away as non-Muslim. He's saying this to the captives, who he could do anything with. He says this, لَوْ كَانَ مُتْعِمْ بِنْ عَدِي حَيًّا ثُمَّ كَلَّمَنِي فِي هَأُولَاءِ النَّتْنَا لَأَتَلَّقَتُهُمْ بِهَا أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ And this is narrated in Bukhari Sharif. That if Mut'im bin Adi was alive today, if Mut'im bin Adi was alive today, and if he was to ask me, the O Muhammad, free these captives, because of the contribution of Mut'im bin Adi, لَأَتَلَقْتُهُمْ بِهَا I would have freed all these captives, because of the saying of Mut'im bin Adi. 
لو كان متعم بن عدي حيا ثم كلمني في هؤلاء النتنا لأطلقتهم بها Who is he saying this about? Mut'im bin Adi. He's died as a non-Muslim. But to appreciate the contribution which Mut'im bin Adi did for Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wants to appreciate that contribution by saying, لَوْ كَانَ مُتْعِمْ بِنْ عَدِي If Mut'im bin Adi was alive today, and if he was to ask, and if he was to tell me, that, Oh Muhammad, can you free all these captives? I would have freed them because of the saying of Mut'im bin Adi. My brothers and sisters, this is the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That if someone, a non-Muslim, has done anything good to us, then at least thank them. If we had a neighbor and they've moved, and it's been a couple of years, then after the Sira session, take your phone out and send a text message to them. If there was a non-Muslim at work and he was good to you, and he's left, we've left work, then text him. Appreciate the contribution which they've done to you. This is the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever did anything, any favor to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my Nabi would make sure that he's repaid that favor to him. Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, who, do, who doesn't know him? He is not a hypocrite. He is the leader of all the hypocrites. He is not a hypocrite. He is a leader. Ibn Salul, the leader of all the hypocrites. And regarding hypocrites, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ They would be in the lowest of the lowest of Jahannam. Scholars have here stated that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to say here that they will be even lower than Abu Jahl, meaning their punishment will be even severe than Abu Jahl. Why? Because of them being hypocrite. Who, who are hypocrite? That being in the in the presence of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a Muslim, but they were non-Muslims. Inside they are non-Muslims. So this is Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. The amount of to- the amount of torture, the amount of things which he did. Against Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam You know, we can, I cannot mention it He is the one who instigated The false accusation Of the wife of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That she did something bad Na'udhu billah Could you believe? Abdullah ibn Salul He is the one who instigated this And for 50 days In Madinat al-Munawwara People, the, the, the non-Muslims they were taunting Prophet ﷺ because of this accusation. Because no verses of the Qur'an had been revealed to, to purify Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala. And who started this? Abdullah ibn Salul. After 50 days, the Qur'anic verse was revealed. This is why they say, there's an English proverb, that keep your friends close, but your enemy closer. Because in Makkah in Makkah al-Mukarramah, the issue they had, the, the, the Muslims, was, was the mushrikeen. So the, the only force which was against the Muslims at that time were the mushrikeen. But in Madinah al munawwara they had a double problem. They had the, the, outs, the, the enemies who were, outside, who were outside, but they had enemies within Madinah al munawwara who were called hypocrites. When Prophet would go out to Madinah and these hypocrites, they would make plans. They would, uh, they would spy upon Prophet and who's the leader of, of this group? Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul. And, the, and what I want to, the reason I'm saying this, what I want to mention is, my Nabi, if anyone did any favor upon Prophet wasallam, whether he's a Muslim, he's a non-Muslim, or he's an enemy, he would repay that favor back. So Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, at the age of 62, around 61, 62, when Prophet is 61 or 62, he passes away. His son, Abdullah, he's a Muslim. Could you imagine? Son is a Muslim, but his father is a leader of hypocrites. He comes to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Oh Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my father has passed away. So obviously this, this day must, be, must have been the day of rejoice, a day of happiness, that a, a, a leader of hypocrite has passed away. What does he say, Abdullah, meaning his son? Oh Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, could you lend, could you give me your garment? 
so I can put it in the qabr of my father. Who? In the qabr of Abdullah ibn Ubay. Could, what is he saying to Prophet Sallallahu Oh Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi could you give me your garment so, I, so that I can put that garment with the coffin of my father. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know what he does? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam takes his garment off and he gives it to Abdullah. Umar radiallahu ta'ala cannot believe this. The how, oh Prophet, how can you do this? An enemy. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he's, you're giving your garment to his, to his son so that he can put it in his uh, part of the shroud. Mu'arriqeen writes that the reply of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, Allahu Akbar. Ba'al of Badr happened. This is going back to Ba'al of Badr. Ba'al of Badr happened. And in Battle of Badr, 70 people were captured. And in the captives, one of them was Abbas. Radiallahu ta'ala. The uncle of Prophet. He was also a captive here. Now Abbas was a very tall figure. When he was a captive, Prophet saw him that my uncle. And he's one of the captives. He didn't have enough clothes on him. So he asked, that, is there anyone whose clothes will fit my uncle? Because Abdul- Abbas was really huge, was very tall. And there's no one except for Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul. Only his clothing would fit the clothing on Abbas radiallahu ta'ala. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul gave his clothing, gave his garment, to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so that he can give it to Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and my Nabi said the oh my Nabi that favor which your father did in Badr seven years ago he has not forgotten that favor happened how many years ago? seven years ago but the contribution even of a non-Muslim my Nabi did not forget so my brothers and sisters listening at home if someone has done good to us, a non-Muslim, then do not forget their contribution. If they are alive, make dua for them. If they have passed away, then make dua for their children, if they are alive. Make dua for their children, if they are alive. But, send a text message. Say thank you to them. This is the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as I was saying, Mut'im bin Adi, I'm going back to the boycott now. Mut'im bin Adi and Hakim ibn Hizam, these are the people who are smuggling food for Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now it's reached the third year. Boycott happened 47, 48, 49. Third year. Could you imagine? the pain which the, the, the Muslims and the non-Muslims of that tribe, but especially the Muslims must have gone through at that time. It is stated that when it came for, uh, when, when the third year came, some people of Makkah al Mukarramah, some non muslim again, some good non-Muslims, they thought to themselves, this is too much. Third year and nothing is happening. We need to do something. So Hisham ibn Amr, he goes to Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyah and he says, look, we need to do something about this. At night, we're hearing the wailing sound of children. How can we stay in Makkah al-Mukarma like this? And sleep in our beds, listening to, the, to those children crying. We can't. Zuhair said, I know, you're, you're, you're right, we can't do anything. But what, what, what are we going to do, us two? We can't do anything. This was a, a declaration has been made, a boycott. And it's hung inside the Kaaba. We can't do anything else to. So they said, okay, let's find another person who will help us. So they went to Mut'im bin Adi. Oh, Mut'im bin Adi, would you be part of this group? Mut'im bin Adi agreed. Okay, I'll be part of your group. Then they went to another person, Abu Mukhtari. Oh, Abu Mukhtari, will you help us? We're forming a group to demolish, to, uh, to put a stop on this boycott. Abu Mukhtari agrees, yes. Then they say, we need a f- fifth person. Then that's a group. So they went to Zuma'a ibn Abil As'ad and they said, are you ready to help us? He said, yeah. 
Now five people have got together, non-Muslim. Some of them became Muslim. That, come on, let's, let's, let's do something. Now five people against the Quraysh of Makkah, or the Mushrikeen. How could they win? But whenever a strategic plan is done, then my brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter about people. It doesn't matter about quantity. It matters. This is why planning is very important. Whenever you start an organization, whenever you do something, utilize at least 10% of your time in planning. Strategic planning. They did a strategic planning. They said, we'll, we've, and, and they made a plan. What they said was, uh, and this is the plan they did. One day, when Abu Jahl and all the mushrikeen were outside Kaaba, Zuhair, he sat in one corner. Hisham sat in another corner. Abu al-Mukhtari sat on another corner. As if they've never met before. As if they don't know each other at this moment in time. They sat in different corners. And then Hisham stood up and said, Oh Abu Jahl, what's this? That we're wearing clothes. We're having nice time here. And we can hear the wailing sound of those people who are trapped in Sha'ab Abi Talib. What's this? Abu Jahl. So Abu Jahl stood up and he said, this was an agreement which we made. Do you know? When he said this, Zuhair stood up from the other corner. Oh Abu Jahl, what's this agreement you're talking about? We didn't even agree on this. Abu Jahl now is talking to Zuhair. Just then, Abu al-Mukhtari stands up. Now when this happens, those people who are there, they start thinking, oh, wait a minute, one person has said, second person has said, third person has, has agreed. So there must be truth in this. And then four persons stand, stood up, and fifth person stood up. They all met together, but this was a strategic plan to make it that, uh, that they're agreeing without even meeting up. And like this, the pole of Makkah changed. Meaning, people started having sympathy, sympathy on the Sha'ab Abi Talib, on the people who were trapped. But again, they couldn't do anything. So then, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reached the age of 49 now, the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala came. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said to Abu, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the old Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that treaty which they made and they wrote and it's hung in the Kaaba, that's been eaten up by termites, by ants. And this was a message by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa goes up to Abu Talib and says to Abu Talib, Oh Abu Talib, my uncle, I have been told that that form, that declaration on which they've written all these points is abundant because it's been eaten by termites. Except for the word Bismikallahumma. Except for these words Bismikallahumma, everything else has been eaten. Abu Talib said to Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Oh my nephew, are you saying the truth? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Yes, I am saying the truth. This is a message given to me by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, Abu Talib, he goes to Abu Jahl and he says that I have come here with a proposal. Now, this is what they were waiting for all this time for Abu Talib to come and to say something. So they said, okay, what's the proposal? What do you want to say? So Abu Talib says, look, I say this, that that, that boycott, parchment, has been eaten up by termites, except for the words, Bismikallahumma. If this has happened, if this has happened, that it's been eaten up, and there's only Bismikallahumma left, then you, ab- meaning, uh, 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 abandon this boycott, end this boycott. If not, if what I'm saying is not right, and that, tree, that declaration is still in there, intact, then I give you my word that I will give you Muhammad to you. And this was the moment which they were looking for. What a perfect opportunity for them to agree on this. Because what to them it was, what is the chance of this happening? That termites, you know, the little, like ants, eating that parchment 
And only Bismillahumma being left, that's impossible. So they agreed. They said, okay. The agreement is, we will take that parchment out. If the only words which are left is Bismillahumma, then this boycott has ended. But if not, if there are other words there, if it's intact, then as per your words, you will hand over Muhammad to us. And Abu Talib agreed on this. Could you imagine? So Abu Jahl then called Mut'im. Can you go inside Kaaba and can you bring that parchment? He goes inside Kaaba and he comes in front of Abu Jahl. And the only thing left of that parchment was Bismikallahumma. The only thing left of that parchment was Bismikallahumma. And because they had agreed on this fact, the boycott ended. So at the age of 49, this is how this boycott ended. Because of the revelation coming to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and him telling this to Abu Talib and Abu Talib informing this and putting this proposal in front of Abu Jahl and the other people and them agreeing and this is how the whole uh, uh, agreement of uh, boycott ended. My brothers and sisters, initially my plan was to continue 40, the age of 50 as well. 40, we've covered 47, 48, 49. And today I was going to cover the age of 40, 50 as well. But due to lack of time, I think it's been about an hour. And I think it's more than enough for a serious session. After the boycott, something happened. Two, three incidents happened simultaneously within a couple of months. And very sad incident so sad that my Nabi referred those that year as Amul Huzn and inshallah what those three incidents were inshallah we will discuss this in our next week's session so my brothers and sisters listening at home as I stated before the whole purpose of doing Sira session is so that we take lessons from the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the lesson which for myself and everyone listening is which I want everyone to take is that if someone has done good to us if he's a Muslim then say Jazakallah appreciate that help even if he's a non-Muslim even if that person is a non-Muslim appreciate their contribution and thank them for the help even if it's been a couple of years and you thank them initially just text him, how are you? How is everything? And never forget appreciating the contribution of others. Even, even with little things. Even with little things. So for example, I'll just give you an example then I'll finish a serious session. For example, uh, we want to buy a computer. Just a very simple example. We want to buy a computer. We're not very... Uh, we don't have much knowledge about computers, so we phone our friend up. The, oh, my friend. Oh, Ahmed, I'm going to PC well today. I'm, and I'm going to buy a, P, a PC. Which PC should I buy? And he says, uh, let me quickly look on the computer. He does Google, Google. And he tells you, this particular PC is really good. Make sure you buy that. You go and you buy that PC. Now, 99.9%, we will forget that person. We will forget that person. We will come home. We will set up that PC. And this, this was everything. Someone shows uh, a good girl in the house that there's a girl here. Uh, your son, I think, is suited. And then, because of this person, the marriage happens. And then we forget. We should, after things happen, we should text that person. We should tell him that Jazakallah, it was because of you this has happened. Jazakallah, that I bought that computer and I just like to phone you back and say Jazakallah. It's simple, simple etiquette which we learn from the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They appreciate whatever someone does to us. By the least we can do is say, Jazakallah. My Nabi said, the least a person can do when someone does to us is say, Jazakallah. 
to that person. So with these words, I will conclude the Sira session today. Today is Thursday night, Friday. And as Muslims, we are told that we should be reciting Duru Sharif every single day. But on a Friday, we should be reciting Duru Sharif abundantly upon Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's a humble request for myself and everyone that take some time out. Take some time out and recite Duru Sharif. Even 10 times, even 10 times, recite Duru Sharif. Even if it's a short durush, the sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Recite it. 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. Not only yourself, tell your family members that inshallah before going to sleep, we'll recite durush sharif upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Reciting durush sharif is like an appreciation of what Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did for us. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May Allah subhanahu wa send blessings upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The more blessings we will send upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The more closer we will become to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So with these words I will conclude May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly give me the tawfiq And then the rest of us who have been listening To act upon the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Wa akhiru da'wana And alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi wa sallam